Starting from where we left off the last slide, we had the section that started on operability, and we had said that we've got this inconsistency. It's actually a big problem, right? Especially for your frame, where you are right now, your career, you've gone through two, three, four years of school, get back and um, look at just steady state base case design of the process. And what I tried to convince you last time was that that's not going to be good enough and will not succeed if you're trying to create or design the process based on that, that frame of reference. So the way you've been thinking about things so far is that you've been given a base case to design, right? So your two D assignments, your fluid flow and heat transfer assignments are all for what? Like one fluid flow coming into a reactor. Um, one flow rate, one recycle stream at a, at a given flow rate, at a given specification. Then you've gone and designed the process. So you've made, you've created the reactor size, or you've calculated the area of the heat exchanger, and then that's the end of the problem, right? But the point I'm trying to make in this section of the course over the next two, three weeks is that doing that is not going to lead to a process that's going to work. By the time you construct and start up that process, these requirements have changed and the environment in which the process will operate will be very different. There will be disturbances and changes that you need to make. And that's what we're going to focus on in this uh, first part. So when we look through the slides here, talking about what the design process is. And we then ended up by talking about how your approach in Aspen so far has been to work through this, you select the process technology, you've got your process structure in Aspen now for your project, You've simulated your flow sheets and you're now at this stage where you're designing and sizing and costing that equipment. But what we're going to see in today's class is that there's other considerations you need to take into account. And we've spoken to, I've had 19 hours of meetings with all the groups over the past three, four days. And in every single one of those meetings, the biggest issue has come up is recognizing that there needs to be some variation away from the base case. That that Aspen flow sheet you have in front of you is not going to be a process that's operable and will not succeed if you build it. So we're going to look at, at some of those in uh, the next few classes to see what you need to do to get that process working. So some of the things we need to consider, so this is the new slide here, slide 14 and onwards. The new the things you have to consider when you're designing that process is to recognize that you do not have a single operating point. So changes introduced by the plant personnel deliberately. What this means, this is you. This is you in your office recognizing that that base design needs to change to some other operating point. Because, for example, you may now find yourself in an economic situation where if you make a thousand tons per day of methanol, you're not going to be able to sell it all. There's only demand for 800 tons per day of methanol. So what, what do you do then? So at the end of your process, you don't, that extra 200 tons per day, you produce it, you have to put it somewhere, right? You don't have infinite storage capacity, so you recognize if I'm only able to sell 800 tons per day of it, what is it that you're going to go and do now? What do you go change? Yeah, you reduce your throughput, like your rate of production. Okay, so decrease rate of production, but a bit more specific than that. What, what would you act? You as the engineer, you are now responsible for implementing this change to 800. What is it that you're going to change in your process? There isn't a single button on your process that says change rate of throughput, right? You don't have that. So what do you actually go and implement? Thoughts? <coughs> You've all looked at your sections of the flow sheet. What would you change in your flow sheet to reduce that? Now, what else 
like think of the other units on your flow sheet. It's not just the turning down the flow rate of the reactants coming into your into your system. What else do you need to check? Okay. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff to go do. Just adjust everything else accordingly. So this is where I'm trying to make you appreciate. What is it that you also need to go and adjust accordingly? Flow through all your heaters and cooler LED exchangers. Right, so go alter the flows to your heat exchangers. If you keep those flow rates into your heat exchangers where they were, you're going to overcool or overheat various feed streams. Okay. So there's more than just turning down the reactor. You can rely on the automatic feedback control system to do some of the work for you. But on many loops and on many um, set points are set by hand valves. So we need to go and change not only our feed into the process, but all the other units around those need to be altered. Think of the case when you also go increase your rate. Now it's the opposite. You may need extra cooling or extra heating. So we don't design just for the base case rates of sales, we design for 25% more or 50% greater level of sales. And so then our heat exchanges need to be sized larger as well for those types of situations. Um, in this particular project we're dealing with, some groups are dealing with biomass, other groups are feeding coal to the gas fire. And so we're producing, um, sorry I meant to refer to this point feeding various feed materials, so coal or biomass, to your, to your first unit over there. So that unit, um, none of the groups in this class are asking you to design for both cases. Every group is designing just for one of the cases. But in a more realistic situation, you had to design a gasifier to accept both types of feeds. So the heat exchangers and the control loops around that unit should be able to accept both feed materials without being adjusted. Um, many processes we require this flexibility of producing multiple products. And this is particularly prevalent in industries where you're producing very small quantity of products, or so pharmaceuticals, uh, specialty chemicals, polymer processes. You'll use the same piece of equipment, the same heat exchangers, the same condensers, reboilers. All of those units need to be able to operate and produce all the variety of products that you produce. So when you size and design those units, you have to find the combination that will lead to the most demand. So find the heat exchanger area that's maximum for the worst case product. So this is a non-trivial piece of work, right? This is several masters and PhD pieces worth of work over here. And this is current research still. It's how to design a process so that it can meet all these criteria at the same time. Um, and, and obviously, as you can see from that, it's a good amount of aspirin simulation and design from that perspective. Other units that are more realistic, these are, uh, so not more realistic, more common that you will see in your day-to-day -day career are dealing with these disturbances. So you as the engineer or an, an operator will have to deal with the fact that your feed composition is changing. So that crude oil that you're receiving from Saudi Arabia comes from different oil fields at different times of the year. Or if you're making polymer, your resin comes from different suppliers and there's no consistency between suppliers and even within this from the same supplier month to month, they'll be sending you slightly different raw materials with different impurities and those impurities will release more heat in your reaction, release less heat in your reaction. So your reactor needs to be able to deal with a whole variety of inlet compositions different temperatures in the atmosphere around you. So summer, winter operation, we've had a lot of discussion with the different groups on this point with cooling water. Right? So cooling water, for those of you that have heat exchanges where you're cooling a stream based on cooling water, you have to size that for summertime operation when your cooling water in that stream is at the highest temperature. Winter time, your cooling water in that temperature is easy to obtain and is really low. But in the summertime, that number is the worst case, so designed for worst case situation. Designed for the case when your catalyst is deactivated to the point where you're just about to shut down the process and, uh, and change out that catalyst or regenerate it. So worst case catalyst deactivation, worst case heat exchange of power. 
And so all of these require you to go to your Aspen simulation and not just use the base case design, but you have to go change that efficiency. So if the heat exchanger assumes 100% of the area being used, well, once the heat exchanger is fouled, we don't have 100% of that area available to us anymore. Only some fraction of that is available to us. So when you have to over-design that heat exchanger, use a larger area, your capital costs increase as a result of that. So uh, uh, we've, we've had this discussion with all the groups, uh, so this, is, this shouldn't be too new to, to anyone. Some other, some other concerns we have is that we do not have a perfect model of the world. So Aspen, you may think that Aspen's models are pretty accurate, and by and large they're, they, they are, but they're certainly not perfect relative to what you will actually experience. So if you simulate a distillation column in Aspen for a given feed, and you go to your process that has that same feed composition, you'll be somewhat surprised to measure different temperatures, different pressures, different compositions than what Aspen is predicting. Okay, because Aspen is using those Peng Robinson equations and vapor liquid equilibrium models, and those models do not perfectly predict the compositions and, and so forth of the various streams. So when you simulate versus what you actually will see, you'll see that your equilibrium actually achieved, your rates of constants actually experienced, will be very different to what, what's used in, well, not very different, but somewhat different to, um, to what Aspen has. So again, this is why we over-design our processes to compensate for these imperfections. We'll also see over the next few classes, we have to <coughs> anticipate problems on our process. So we have to recognize that sometimes our valves will fail and our heat exchangers will fail a hole may start to form and due to corrosion in a heat exchanger. We need that heat exchange to still occur, but we now don't have a heat exchanger to do it. Right? So what will what will implement are systems in our process, extra valves, parallel <coughs> circuits through our process, so that critical pieces of equipment will not fail on us. Or at least if they do fail on us, we can still continue operating without stopping. So we'll see several ways of doing that. Uh, some are cheap, some are, are less cheap, so that we can operate without stopping our process. So that's coming up in the next few classes. And then finally, we've seen a bit of this in the HASLOP section. Uh, we, we've said that the last thing we want to have happen is someone making a small change to the process causing an unsafe situation. So an operator or yourself as an engineer going to open and close a valve, don't want that to lead to a situation that can, can uh, escalate to something that causes damage or harm to someone. Okay, so if, a, if you go as an engineer and you're not 100% sure and you go close a valve, that action of closing the valve, if it's going to cause a problem, at the very least it needs to alarm someone first and then there needs to maybe be an SIS system or relief so that that action of you closing the valve, maybe the cooling valve to a reactor, it will first create an alarm to an operator, an SIS might kick in, or relief will, and relief might kick in, but you don't want that action to immediately cause the reactor to, to uh, create a problem. Right? So, so we need to instrument our processes with sensors and alarms and, and relief so that we don't create catastrophic failure based on very small actions. Because think of it this way, how many decisions do you or your operators make on a day-to-day -day basis? So in your eight-hour workday, how many decisions are you making? One every minute, one every five minutes in the control room, you're making a lot of small decisions. Right? The probability of making a wrong decision is fairly small, five, ten percent, but any one of them shouldn't lead to a catastrophic failure. Right? Operators especially, they're in a high pressure position making decisions regularly and none of those decisions should lead, lead to a situation that causes damage. Okay, so, so these are five sources, the human error, five malfunctional equipment, our fact that we have imperfection in our models, the fact that we experience disturbances, and the fact that 
what we told, what we were originally told to design versus what we actually need to operate later on. All five of those reasons lead us to building plants and, and, and designing a plant that's, that's quite different from the base case. So the next section I want to go to is are the new notes I handed out. It's a, a chapter called Operating Window. And this is really going to introduce a bit of understanding on just by how much do we need to have this process vary, right? So what is the range by which we need to make this process change? So everyone have this set of notes or this posted last night. And maybe to help introduce the operating window, I'd like you to think of the following situation. Um, so we can do develop the operating window for various units on the process, but think of yourself, right? You also have an operating window, your, your body. So if we look at an operating window, what is the capacity for your body to operate? It has certain ranges for which you can operate. And one thing that you might consider is Look at your calorie intake. Okay. So what's the typical calorie intake? 2,000. If you're female, it's 2,000. If you're male, it's 2,500. Okay, so your base design on average, if you're an average person, is 2,500 calories per day. But what is an operating window? Like what could you go down to and what could you go up to? It's 12,000. It's 12,000, but then there's something else about it that keeps him at steady state. Like he doesn't balloon to something huge at 12,000, because if we plotted physical activity up here, his physical activity is much higher than that. So he's still at steady state taking in 12,000. We're at steady state, we're taking in 2,500, but you could operate at lower values, right? And still with less physical activity. <coughs> but let's plot on this axis, the vertical axis, um, the ambient temperature. So by this I mean if you're outside for most of the day, so think of, a, of, a, of someone say in the construction industry, they're outside and the ambient temperature changes up and down throughout the day. They can operate at steady state for long periods of time outside. So ambient temperature and what would be a lower bound on, on that? Minus 30. <laughs> okay, so okay, let's say, let's clarify this. Make an ambient temperature wearing um, like full clothing, like a jacket on, a sweater and, and full jeans. Minus if you're working. Five, five, ten degrees, okay. So maybe let's put ten degrees outside. But eight hours I could probably survive with, with, with what I've got on. What's a maximum? Well, it depends on the for a period of time, I could, I could maybe survive it uh, for a month. So, what, but now let's look at the intersection of these two variables. So, calorie intake, I could probably survive with how, like, or, or any one of us with, so 2,000, 2,500, which you typically take in every day. What might be a lower bound? But we're not talking about a, a hard lower bound, right? You could obviously take in zero. But um, what's a typical lower bound which you're not going to cause significant damage to? It's like 1,500. Okay, so maybe make it 800, 1,000. Okay, and an upper bound. So we're talking about steady state, right? 4,000. Okay. So now what would the operating window look like? Is it a square? So in other words, this is saying you can operate anywhere inside this region. So is it, is it, is it a box-shaped operating window? 
um, maybe at the extreme values, you actually wouldn't be able to, let's say, have a thousand calorie intake and 40 degrees Celsius, you might not be able to operate at those conditions. Okay, so what might this operating window look like a bit more? Probably slant down to the right because if it's really cold, you'll need more calories to sustain your body. Yeah. Like that. And then we'll like kind of do like a ellipse thing that way. Whatever. Yeah. And then, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we don't know that the reality, right? Without actually trying out various operating points, right? So we'll basically what we're saying is that these regions are not are not feasible. Okay. From a sustained Okay, so the operating window for your human body based just on those two variables could look something like that. It's, it's, it's certainly not box shaped, but it's, um, it's definitely some sort of got some constraints on reasons that regions are feasible. So this is feasible operation, this is infeasible over here. Okay, so that's, and you could then go build an operating window let's say on uh, heart heat over here, and physical activity, or body temperature. So our body temperature, can, we can operate our bodies typically, well, obviously at 37 degrees, but we can, we can still survive with lower temperature, body temperature, and higher body temperature. And heartbeat, you've got a range of heartbeats, so during physical activity or sedentary activity that, uh, will, that your body operates quite well in, right? So, so this is, this is a key point, right? Here's your design, your base case. Okay, so design, base. But recognize that your body is perfectly capable of operating away from that base case for, for long periods of time. So that's the key point. Now let's take a look at something um, like a flash drum. Right? So we can go do exactly the same thing for a flash drum. And here's the key point when you're designing or figuring out the operating model. What is the achievable steady state region? So you want to find regions where the process can operate stably at steady state. And what we're going to plot on the vertical axis and horizontal axes are things like disturbances or changes to our process. So let's take a look. Here are, here's my flash drum. That we've, we've seen this example before. And I'm feeding it over here. So I feed it at a certain temperature, T1, there's heat it up with a process stream, I heat it up with some steam, then I get a temperature T5 that's greater than the inlet temperature T1. Feed it at a certain flow rate F that I can measure over here, F1, into my flash drum. So there's a vapor liquid mixture coming into that drum. Some of that vapor goes off in the overhead, some of the liquid leaves at the bottom. Okay, so that's, that's the principle of operation. Now let's take a look at this vertical axis. This is the temperature at which I feed coming in over here. So that temperature T1 is the vertical axis. Let's maybe add it to this. So this is temperature T1, feed temp. And this, ver this horizontal axis is the feed flow. So this is F1, feed flow. So there's the operating window that Dr. Marlin has drawn. For you. But take, take a few minutes and figure out how those five lines were calculated. So here's five lines, one, two, three, four, five, that define that operating window. What does it mean to operate down here along this lower line? What does it mean to operate this vertical line and, and all, the, all the other five lines? Okay, so take a minute or two and, and figure out how this operating window was found. <coughs> So, 
product what what happens if I'm at this corner what what changes on my process if I'm at low feed flow rate with low incoming temperature what do I need to do to still achieve this key point up here achieve steady state basically I'm finding the lowest flow rate I can feed to my flash drum and the lowest temperature that can be there in that stream T1 so if that's the lowest flow and the lowest temperature, what do I need to do to still operate that process? Heat it up a lot. Heat it up a lot. And what would that mean in, hmm? in operating motion? Okay, so F2 and F3 are their maximum. Okay, so at this point over here, so we've got low feed, low feed, uh, low feed temperature, low flow, this implies F2 and F3 are max. Okay. So for that heat exchanger area, for that flow rate of cooling water, uh, flow, flow rate of process stream and for this flow rate of steam, I can still operate. If I go to any lower feed flow rates, and lower temperatures, I will not be able to heat up that stream sufficiently. Okay, so if I, in particular, if I reduce my temperature down from here at minus 10 to minus 20, I wouldn't be able to heat up that stream sufficiently to still operate this flash drum and produce the desired products that I need to produce. Okay, because the inlet temperature is too low and I'm unable to provide the heat input required for it. So then I can move up along this axis here. So I can operate at that low feed flow. And as I'm going up here to 60 degrees, what is changing? So as I move up along this line, what happens? You're closing the valve on your heat changes. OK, so F2 and F3 close. Till I get to this point, and they're 100% shut. So at this point, 60 degrees, I've determined if my feet was any hotter than 60 degrees and these valves were fully shut, that basically says T1 equals T2 equals T5 and that's 60 degrees entry my flash. If I entered at higher than 60 degrees C, this feed coming in now is not going to have the correct vapor liquid equilibrium. It might mean that there's too much vapor and I simply 
essentially just send everything up to the latent stream. At 60 degrees, there's no liquid or not enough liquid, and I don't get the correct composition that I'm looking for. So operation above 60 degrees is not feasible. So all of this horizontal line up here at the top then says F2 and F3 are shut. Okay, so they're fully, fully closed. And that's the limit at which I can operate that in that temperature. What happens to come down, come down here now? At, when I move across here though, what am I doing? To move across from left to right, what's changing? Okay, so I'm opening opening F1 in order to move there. Okay, so I get to a certain point, then what's happening at that point? Why can I not go higher than that? I cannot, so this is at 180. Why can I not go above 180? Okay, you cannot open your valves anymore. So maximum liquid valve opening for F1. That's the maximum that I can feed through there. Okay, so I come down to a certain point. So here I'm, I'm doing the opposite. So F2 and F3 are now, uh, we're closing going in this direction. So this implies F2 and F3 open up. Then what does this diagonal constraint represent? Or maybe I should ask it this way. Why can I not operate over there? Because like, if your F2 and FDR are maximum, so as your feed rate increases, you can't heat up enough anymore. Right. Okay, so at this point, F2 and F3 are 100% open. But even if they're 100% open, this feed flow F1 is so high, I cannot provide the amount of heat input required to that column. So there's this whole region over here of feed flow combinations and inlet temperatures that just physically the process will not be able to work at that, in that, in that zone. Okay. Now, our process is nominally designed to operate here. So this is my nominal point. But as my production capacity varies in my process, in other words, let's say F1 over here, that flow, this comes back to the very first point I made in the class today that said we have to sometimes work with our processes at low throughput, sometimes at high throughputs. And so that's exactly what F1 is. F1 is measuring the throughput in my process. So that's determining this horizontal axis. This is my base case, but I can move anywhere to lower flows and higher flows. But this operating window is telling me I cannot go below that flow and I cannot go above that flow. The, the feed temperature, so this feed flow is, a, is an input into my process. This feed temperature is a disturbance. The upstream unit from me is giving me the stream at a flow rate and at a particular temperature. I cannot control that inlet temperature, right? I'm simply given it. But what I can do is I can change T1 to the desired value of T5. Okay, so, and I do that by adding these two heat exchanges. However, there's only a finite capacity that I can accept. Exactly the same here as your human body. You can only operate within certain ranges of temperature. This flash drum is no different. Coming in over here, it can only accept a certain ranges of temperature coming in that define this, this type of uh, vertical axis. Okay. So this is the key point on, on the operating window, is we design our process for over here, but it's no good if your process was only able to operate at that point.
same as your human body, we'd be totally non-functional if we could only operate at 25 degrees Celsius. Right? We'd, we'd live in such an awful world if that was the only area in which our body was able to operate at. And if we had to have a certain amount of food intake, so we, we expect our processes, in the same way we expect our body to operate and, and accept a wide variety of inputs, we expect our processes to do exactly the same thing. Okay. So the operating window tells us by how much. Let's take a look at a different example. Here's, um, here's one for an exothermic reactor. <coughs> So I'm feeding the reactant with a particular reactant over here, and a solvent comes in, so there's A, and a, and a solvent that's required for it, comes in at a certain temperature, reaction occurs, it's exothermic, so it takes some of the heat away with a cooling stream. There's an operating window drawn for you over there. Why does that look the way it does, and does it make sense? concentration. So that's the, the concentration in the tank or, or leaving, it doesn't matter, it's a CSTR. So the concentration of the reactants and then on the vertical axis we're plotting the reactor's temperature. So what does that say then? If you're going to high temperatures, so as my temperature goes higher and higher, my operating window seems to shift over to the left over here. Does that make sense at high, high temperatures? But because as your temperature increases, your rate would increase, so your concentration would go down. And also you need a higher temperature at lower concentrations just because of the way that the kinetics would work okay, so for an acceptable rate. For an acceptable rate, yeah. So for at higher temperatures, so 440, 460 Kelvin, as my temperature goes up, my reaction rate constant uh, goes 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 up, so I'm consuming more of my reactant A. So concentration of A, my reactant A drops down. I'm consuming more of that reactant and it reacts away. As the temperatures go lower and lower, that reaction kinetics slow down and my concentration leaving is higher away. Okay, so you may be used to, in a reactor design, just to see a yeah, single line, right? yeah. so a single curve. Right? But why do I have this sort of banana shape? Mm -hmm. I don't have a single line that I operate along, I've actually got a region. Probably because the value for K is only a theoretical constant, and it actually has some fluctuation depending on the and stuff. Right, so K is purely theoretical. This feed stream may have some minor impurities that also take participates in a side reaction. So we we have imperfect knowledge on our processes. Fouling on, on this cooling coil that, that that even despite this coolant over here, the, the temperature in the reactor will not be exactly what we think it is. So for all, for all those imperfections, we don't actually have a single curve that we operate along. We have a region that we operate operate along. And the other thing that's interesting and to emphasize about the operating window is that this zone over here, feasible, determines steady state operation. There absolutely will be times where you deviate outside this region and then return back at steady state. So for, for some transient period of time, let's say you increase this reactant concentration. So Ca0 coming in goes 
peaks up. So you, you switch over to an, a reactant that's slightly higher concentration. You're now introducing more reactants into the system. So that concentration goes up. The reaction rate increases, releases a bit more heat. You move to higher temperatures. So temporarily, you'll, you'll increase your reaction rate. Your temperature goes up. Okay? But then you'll come back into this region again as this feedback control on the coolant notices the temperature is too high. It has to bring you back into control again. The small deviations outside that zone are totally expected. But this is indicating steady state <coughs> operation. Okay, so operating window is just getting to terms with the fact that our processes don't have a single point, but there's a range of points. Okay, some other notes here on the operating window just to, to mention. The first major one in, that you're probably concerned with right now is how do you know this operating window? How do I figure out that window? Yeah. Well, the way we do it is we use a lot of our engineering knowledge. Right? So this is comes back to like why this course is sort of where it is in your curriculum is because we're going to take and draw on all your reactor design knowledge, your process control systems knowledge, your fluid flow heat transfer knowledge to figure out what this window might be from your intuition and your 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 training as an engineer so far. But you can also use some tools to verify that window. So it's quite easy to go to Aspen, put in a flash drum, change the feed temperature, change the feed flow rate, and see whether that flash drum is producing product that's on spec, and if that's desirable. And you can go change it to various points around here and determine where you just start to become infeasible. Okay, so you can say, well, I'm going to size that valve so that it's capable of a given flow rate. But notice here that you can say, well, the, the maximum flow on that pipe is for 180 units. But if I keep taking this flow rate down, 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 down to a certain point, below, beyond that point, I'm not going to be able to provide the heat input into that flow stream. And I'm not going to be able to operate that flash drum to produce the products there. So, uh, these operating windows are determined by, by a bit of trial and error and simulation to, to figure out what their sizes are and what shape they have. Uh, you can also make, make an empirical determination of that operating window, but usually your boss won't allow you to do that because when you, when you do that, you'll be making products that you cannot sell or you might potentially create unsafe operation in the process. So, but you can actually go back to your databases on your process and collect all that data and plot, plot the data on, on the system to see what ranges we were able to operate at in the past. Uh, bear in mind it's not always a polygon. And the other thing, that, by that I mean there can, be, there can be holes in that region. So sometimes you don't see it too much here, but very often you can get, you can get regions in there that are just not, not capable of operating. We'll, um, and I may have an example of that further down. Um, and then finally, uh, recognize that it's definitely not two-dimensional. Right? So here in the human body example, we look at calorie intake versus ambient temperature. But I could have a third axis of heartbeat and a fourth axis of physical activity. Right? So you, can, you can have multiple dimensions on this, but obviously it's not visualized. Okay, so. Here's another example for you to consider on your own time to figure out what parameters affect the operation for a distillation column. So many groups have distillation columns in their flow sheets. Uh, there's constraints on flows, constraints on uh, reflux ratios, on purities. And this slide talks a bit about what those parameters are. So you can go construct an operating window for yourself based on low flow, at the reboiler versus high flow. So by that, to influence that, in other words, you're saying, what happens if I turn off the flow rate to that heat exchanger on my reboiler? So basically, I'm not sending any vapor back up. That's clearly going to be infeasible operation. So then turn up that flow rate of the heater to <coughs> some low value, and then keep ramping it up, 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 and see what happens to the column's operation. Can you still achieve steady state? 
Okay? You can go try that with various flows and uh, valve, valve opening positions on that pump. Here's another one. So in many of the groups we've discussed heat exchanger design in our group meetings. Take a look at this example. Here's a heat exchanger that we want to cool down the street. So I'm providing cooling water on the tubes and that cooling water is going to leave at a higher temperature. Here's my inlet stream, hot coming in, and I want it to leave at a certain outlet temperature over here. What's the worst possible combination of events that could happen? So I want my process to still work. I still want to achieve that outlet temperature, despite the worst possible combination of events on this heat exchange. What might those events be that occur? Um, lack of cooling water and uh, high flow rate of the hot process fluid. Okay, so very high flow rates of this process fluid coming in. Little to no cooling water coming in. Great. Um, even that cooling water could be a hot day, so that cooling water temperature is warmer. Cooling water coming in really warm on a hot day. The process fluid is hotter for some reason. The process fluid is not at its, at its design point, but at a higher temperature. Yes. Um, a lot of corrosion within the heat finger. Corrosion and fouling. So the tubes on the heat exchanger, either on the interior or exterior of those tubes, have some fouling buildup on it. So that the effective area, A, over there, is not what it is. Or another way to see it is that you, your heat transfer coefficient is smaller. So fouling depletes your heat, heat exchange. Uh, sorry reduces your heat transfer coefficients. <coughs> there's, the, there's some of those points on this, on the next slide there that you have that emphasize those. So the lowest flow rate coming in at the highest temperature, so that combination would be the worst possible cooling water you receive. Low flow, high temperature. The worst inlet stream is high flow and high temperature and with the greatest amount of foul. You still want to achieve this temperature the lowest required temperature on this stream. So what it, there's, a, there's a range of temperatures required on that outlet. You still want to achieve the lowest possible temperature despite all of these other events occurring. So how do you figure out what this low, highest temperature is over there on the cooling water coming in? So we've had this discussion with, with the groups in the various meetings. This would be the inlet temperature on the hot summer day. Right? So look at cooling water flow sheets and figure out, and there's a bit of reading you have to do there if you don't know this, but what is the highest temperature that, or the, the worst case temperature on the cooling water? And fouling, what are typical fouling rates? Is it 50%, 60%, 80%? How fast do you heat exchanges foul? So, so there's some reading and assumptions that need to be made to, to get this design. Okay. So we'll end over.